Yeah, hi everyone, uh, my name is PK and here I have Brendan Colley and today's episode is all about a look at stock or share investment versus property investment and traditionally people who sell property related goods or services or whatever, we're quite biased towards property but what Brendan has done of his own accord really is create a, a quite objective and unbiased model over a time horizon 20-30 years with all sorts of assumptions to see, well, actually, does property win in the long term, short term, or does stocks or, or um, share investing win? And of course, we all know various pros and cons of stocks versus property. For example, one of the pros of property is leverage. Of course, you can leverage stocks as well, perhaps not always as much. Um, but of course, leverage comes with risks. And if you look at the last 50, 100 years of, of the share market, whether it's global or local, there's higher volatility, which is obviously a proxy for risk, which real estate doesn't have. So that's one of the pros of real estate versus stock investing time. I think in terms of time, real estate loses out. It's a little bit more of an onerous thing to buy and hold a property than stock investing. You know, of course, there's always exceptions to every rule, but I'm just generalizing, painting a bit of a picture before we get into it. Value add, you can value add in property through renovations, development, you can, you know, be in control of making money, whereas in real in stock investing, you can't, you know, we can't really do so as much. And the control aspect is really where real estate comes into its own sort of strength, where you, you basically have control over that asset. Whereas if you invest in a company or a suite of companies, you'll be held into the management changes, policy changes, industry changes, sector, you know, headwinds or tailwinds of the company that you know, is performing, it's P&L, et cetera. So you have less control. Um, but ultimately, I think what people want to know is what's the financial result? All of these pros and cons notwithstanding, where am I going to make the most money? And I think that's where Brendan has done a terrific job. Just to introduce Brendan quickly, he's, he's not a client of mine. I have no affiliation with him, nor is he trying to sell anything at all. He's just a humble dude, a uh, really nice and intelligent um, guy who works at, hope I'm allowed to say this, Brendan, he's a senior associate at Queensland Treasury Corporation, a place where I used to do an internship a long time ago. So he's just done this, I guess, as a uh, intellectual curiosity piece more than anything. He's going to actually share the model on his screen. We're going to go through whether stocks versus property, which wins over time with a whole host of assumptions. Um, and I'm really excited because I don't think there's any content out there to this level of detail about pros and cons, which actually wins stocks versus uh, real estate. Welcome to the Oz Property Investment Mastery Podcast. My name's PK and I help busy people build passive income by buying top 5% growth and cash flow property and build a portfolio using data without wasting months doing research, spending weekends at inspection or catching flights or dropping ten dollars to $20,000 on buyer's agents every single time. So if you're confused, lack confidence and just overwhelmed with all the information and marketing misinformation available online and don't know where to start, then this show is for you. Brendan, thank you so much for making time. It's um, 5 a.m. in Ireland where you're tuning in from. Yeah, thank you, PK. Uh, and hello, everybody joining in. Uh, my name's Brendan. I'll, I'll just start by saying that I, I built this model of my own accord um, and, and the, the results don't reflect that of my employer, Queensland Treasury Corporation. Uh, it's something that I've done completely off um, my own personal interest. Um, so it's so a nothing work related. Uh, yeah, as PK said, I, I'm working finance. I have a, an accounting and finance degree um, and have in my working career have used Excel and financial modeling to serve clients. Um, so producing something like this was, was a little bit in my wheelhouse. And I originally built the tool um, after a discussion with it with a colleague and, and thought it would be interesting to see what the results were after um, after a, a 30 year period. <clears throat> Ultimately, guys, everyone who's watching or listening, we're looking for in the short, medium, long term, where do we make the most equity? Okay, equity is obviously the asset value minus any debt or liability that you have. So should I invest in property or should I invest in stocks, which is going to give me the most total accumulated equity? 
And the second question that we're trying to answer in this model, and of course every model has its limitations, it can't answer every single question, is that after a period of time, if we sell down our properties or if we sell down our, our stocks or shares, you know, in which scenario are we left with the most cash, all right? So equity and cash outcomes are really what we're looking for. Um, is that a fair sort of introduction of the model's um, intention, Brendan? As well as it was really important to me that the starting um, investment amount was the same. So uh, I'll, I'll talk I'll talk high level through the model uh, now, just, just the general layout for people who are not familiar with uh, financial modeling. So the, the inputs are over on the left. Um, you can see those boxes in, in the, that are highlighted yellow. Um, they're variables that you can change or, or a user can change to create a different outcome. Uh, across the top, we have a timeline, um, which is from year one to 30. And the, the rest of the boxes that you see are, are, are output results um, that are being driven by the boxes in the, in the yellow cells, um, particularly the uh, the starting cash balance of 75,000, which was an arbitrary number that I picked as a, if an investor was to invest 75,000 in either shares or, or property, what would the likely result be? Right, right. I mean, I think the, the valuable discussion is around all of the inputs and sort of the, you know, the assumptions behind the inputs and maybe I can butt in every now and then as well. But if you don't mind, Brendan, scrolling to the bottom of the model just to, to show people what the charts look like, because I think this is what's ultimately important. And, and the first one at the top there to introduce it uh, really quickly is the total accumulated equity. So over time, how what's the, the decoupling or what's the difference between your asset value and your amount of leverage or, or loan amount? Um, and of course that increases in both scenarios um, but on the face of it, it looks like the orange line property seems to be beating shares. And we'll go through the assumptions in a second. And if we scroll down, um, just as a, a, a quick spoiler, total ac available cash balance after sales. So if we hold these assets, whether it's stocks or real estate over the long term, whether it's 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, all the way out to 31 years in this model, once again, it seems like property is is the clear winner, the clear favorite um, over shares. Now, of course, this is a model and individual results can mean that some people may, you know, flip these t results around because of their expertise and experience and what have you. But I just wanted to show everyone these outputs and now we can sort of debate and discuss um, some of the assumptions, which I think is the more interesting and, and valuable part of it. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, Brendan, uh, if we go... Perhaps we can start in um, in the top one, which is the shares, the share inputs. If you if you can just take us through each of these. Um... Yeah, and I'll try and do this relatively quickly. I know that talking about financial modeling isn't <laughs> interesting to everyone, so we'll, we'll, we'll aim to try and get through this as fast as possible. So the starting line to value ratio, that's that's just saying how, how much leverage is involved in, in the asset. Um, I'll, I'll set this to zero. You can... Um, leverage shares. I've done that myself in the past, um, but for most share investors, I'd say would be relatively uncomfortable leveraging shares. Um, which and do you mind? Sorry, I might I might just interject every now and then, just just for the health of the discussion. I hope hope you don't mind with that. Uh, yeah, go for it. So you know, obviously, one of the rebuttals that people might have is, well, you know, you can leverage property. Obviously, in this model, property is a leveraged asset. Um, why aren't we comparing apples with apples? Um, you know, if we do in fact leverage shares to the same quantum as we're leveraging property, let's say 80, 90%, et cetera. Of course, and most banks don't allow that. There are instruments that allow you to do it. I know you'll also agree with me, Brendan, and probably saying that the average mum and dad Australian, there's no way in hell they're leveraging shares at 80 or 90%. But from your, when you did this model and Let's say if we were to create a hypothetical apples and apples example where we do leverage that starting loan to value ratio is 80 or 90% for shares. 
does that materially change the the, the graph outputs, like the, the the outcome of all this? I could do it if you would like. Um, the reason I haven't done it is because most banks will only allow leveraging up to seventy percent for blue chip shares. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's I'd actually argue that you can't leverage a share portfolio beyond seventy percent with most most major lenders. Um, there are bespoke trading companies that will uh, that let you trade, say, contracts for difference or or equities that will let, let you leverage uh, beyond 70%, uh, but I don't think they uh, represent a significant portion of the investor market. I, I think it's interesting when I was playing around with this model that even if we consider quite an aggressive leverage profile of about 50% in shares, even with that, the total accumulated equity over the long term is not materially different between share investing and, and real estate investing. So this is saying, if we go back to the assumptions for a second, so this is saying that um, we've used that 75, initial $75,000 of starting cash to control a portfolio of 150,000. Um, that 150,000 is beginning to earn a yield of 5%. Um, those dividends are fully franked. Um, they're not reinvested. So an investor is taking that cash out of the portfolio each year um, and then they're paying and then the portfolio is growing uh, in price or, or value of seven and a half percent year on year. Uh, so under those assumptions and they can be changed, but under those assumptions, which I've put um, as, as reasonably conservative, uh, the equity growth over that time, the profile looks, uh, looks as follows. Uh, now, people can argue that the assumptions should be different, and that's fine. Um, but these are these are what I've put in. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think um, I think that's very interesting. So even with uh, leveraging shares up to fifty percent, it looks like property beats um, beats stock investing in both of these outcomes. Of course, there's other outcomes and other financial measures where by which you can assess you know investing returns but i think these are the two that the model seeks to to try to find out and i think in terms of some of those assumptions that you just went through the net yield or, or dividend of of around five percent uh what do you make of that brendan do you think that's pretty representative of of what we're seeing over the long term in australia yeah i I will admit I did this based on some past experience, um, so that may have changed. It's been a, it's been a little while since I've owned uh, shares either in managed funds or ETFs or direct equities myself. So, and this obviously changes. So between blue chip stocks, say Telstra, CBA, bank, you know, mining shares, they may have higher dividend payouts than than you would expect from say a startup company who's looking to reinvest that capital to grow their business. So this uh, net yield or dividend percentage needs to be adapted depending on the types of equities that are being held in the portfolio. I, I picked 5% because that was uh, what I remember getting um, from a, a high growth managed fund that I used to have uh, some time ago. Sure, sure. And obviously the individual tax rate at 32% is fine and people can increase that or, or reduce that as necessary. It may need to be increased, um, you know, if there's a big sort of sell-off event um, at a future year in time where there's a lot of capital gains on which to, to pay the tax. But I think importantly, you've used the same tax rate for, for the property example versus the stock invest, investing example. So I think that's apples and apples. And the average growth rate per annum, I think that's pretty representative over the last 30 to, to 40 years, 7.5% um, per annum. Of course, if we go back to sort of mid-1920s and take the last uh, almost 100 years, then actually it's surprising when I found this out, it's actually more than 11% in terms of local equities. And the same exists for, for real estate. So <clears throat> by and of itself, it's not like, real estate grows more than stocks or, or vice versa, whether it's in the medium term or hundred year uh, period of time, it's really a leverage story, I feel, um, that is separating the both of them. 
Um, was there anything else that you wanted to t talk through in terms of the, the share inputs? Just re I'll just really quickly touch on um, what, what fully franked means. So this is, this is a, an input that drives some of the model. Um, in Australia, if you get a franked dividend, it means that the company has already paid tax on that income or that revenue earned, um, which means that the only remaining tax that is to be paid is the difference between the corporate tax rate and your own personal tax rate. Um, so this row of uh, line 12, that's what this these numbers represent. They represent the extra tax that needs to be paid because an individual's tax rate is higher than that of a corporate tax rate. Um, so just for people who may not be familiar with with that. Okay, well, let's let's go down to the property inputs and sort of go back and forth to see whether they are, are pretty reasonable. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll try and get through these. And if there's any in particular that you'd like to talk through in more detail, PK, then, then feel free to jump in. Uh, so, so once again, here, row 31, we see that the initial starting capital is 75,000. Uh, if that is used to purchase an asset worth $450,000, um, that will give us a leverage uh, or, or an LVR of 88%. Um, a, a rule of thumb that's used in the industry is, is generally 5%. That may be different. For example, if you're paying stamp duty in Sydney, it will be different to if you're paying stamp duty in regional Queensland or regional Western Australia. That means that the, so once you take out the, the transaction cost, your remaining investment deposit in the asset is 52,500. Uh, the gross yield, so an important distinguishing feature between property and shares is that in residential property, uh, it's mostly quoted in gross yield, uh, which means that uh, it, it's simply rent divided by the asset price. It, it doesn't include the expenses that are required to run a property. The rent growth rate, um, once again, I've put these in as what I consider to be conservative or reasonable um, and open to opinion and, and argument or what others may think they should be. Uh, capital growth rate, I've put as 7%. I a number that I've always used probably vacant each year. So just being conservative on, you know, every couple of years in residential property, someone's likely to have a, a, a tenant change and, and therefore there might be a week or two worth of vacancy. Um, interest rate on the lending at six and a half percent. That's probably underrepresented. So for an 88% LVR, you, an investor in today's market is probably paying closer to eight or nine percent. Uh, the maintenance costs that's in infrastructure or property, you can use a percentage of asset value as a rule of thumb. Uh, I've put it at 0 0.5 here, um, mainly for the outer years, because once the asset increases in value, that yearly expense looks um, excessive if uh, with, a, with a, a number that's bigger than 0 0.5. Um, and then these remaining assumptions are the year one, the year one expenses, um, so as well as the the amount of uh, the the fee that the property manager collects. I'm assuming that someone has a property manager. I know that some people like to manage properties themselves. I don't personally. I like to pay a property manager. Um, so that's just saying how much of the rent are they expected to uh, collect um, for for their services, uh, and then the selling costs. Once again, this is uh, open to debate, but I um, put that down as uh, zero point eight, and I, I changed I changed the around that, that around a bit. So that's that's just reflecting one of the costs to pay um, a sales agent to market the property, their commission as well as their flat fee, um, trying to reflect that cost in the sale process. Right, great, and I think um, there's probably many people thinking, oh. Uh, probably not agreeing with some of these assumptions. And like Brendan said before, that's the idea of, of a model. So you can play around with the assumptions and really put anything you like in there, depending on your risk profile and your expertise. You know, someone may say that, you know, a, um, a growth rate per annum of 7% is, is maybe too, too low. It, you know, it's, if you time the market, you can get above 10%. And I think that's the case for the share market as well. We've used 7.5% 
in the input for the share market for the average growth rate. And so, of course, some people will, will do better, some people worse. The idea of this is just to use an average. You can outperform the yield story as well. Gross yields at 5%. Personally, I probably would not buy a property with a 5% gross yield. But once again, we're trying to be reflective of something that's that's quite average, you know, or average in the sense, in a statistical way. Um, and in Melbourne and Sydney, you're probably thinking 5% is way too high. And in other places, like perhaps Perth, regional Queensland, other places, you're thinking 5% is way too low. So once again, you can definitely outperform these assumptions. You can also underperform these assumptions. And that's the case for the share trading scenario as well. And I think you mentioned it really well. I just want to clarify if anyone is maybe relatively new to property investing, the gross yield is 5%. It is gross, but then Brendan has netted that out through all these assumptions in terms of interest rate on the loan, maintenance, depreciation, council rates, insurance, water bills, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think once again, the rent growth rate as well, it's up for debate in the last 10 years. It's basically been, well, pre-COVID, it's been sort of CPI going forward. It's probably likely to be CPI times two, <laughs> who knows, over the last sort of 30, 40 years, it has been sort of CPI plus just a little bit, you know, one or two basis points. So these are all assumptions, but I think uh, it's important just to be quite reasonable. And I think that's what Brendan has been in terms of these assumptions for both the share trading example and the property example. And if we go down to the, the charts, once again, um, it looks like uh, property is, you know, clearly winning under both scenarios or both outcomes in terms of total accumulated equity and also in terms of total available cash balance after sale. Now, I know that there's a couple of tricky things in this model um, that that I found as well, and perhaps Brendan, you want to speak about them um, as well in terms of the reinvesting of dividends. Of course, in in property. If we are building a positive cash flow portfolio, for example, which is quite hard to do right now, but you know, over time it becomes positive cash flow as the model suggests. You know, if we're making ten thousand dollars positive cash flow from a let's say from a property, it's very hard to go and buy another property for for ten thousand dollars, right? You need to work up another deposit of let's say sixty thousand dollars, seventy thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, whatever it is. But in stocks, you know, if you get a dividend of ten thousand dollars as an example, you can reinvest that should you want back into your portfolio quite immediately. And so, Brendan, if, if we do, you know, there's that tab there, sell C12, I think it is, dividends reinvested, you know, and, and once again, this is probably not apples to apples versus the property example now, but if we do flex that option and, and bring it to yes, how does that change things? And can you just explain sort of the rationale, anything more than what I've said? Uh, we can do this in two two stages, one with the d dividends being reinvested and we'll see what the outputs are. And then um, another scenario could be if you include the equivalent negative equity um, that you would use to, to own property to see what the outputs are. So if we reinvest dividends, so each year that's that, that asset um, value. So we started with $150,000, that $150,000 uh, under a 50% leverage scenario uh, gets multiplied by uh, a, a net yield or a dividend percentage. And that spits out a, a dividend amount of in this, this case, $2,250 for year one. Uh, we then pay tax on that. And then uh, we, so our net proceeds are 2.2K. Um, if that amount is reinvested, so if this 2,250 is reinvested, we still have to pay tax on it, uh, but that would then grow the asset over time. Um, so it's, it's a bit like paying for cosmetic um, or, or maintenance, a bit like paying for maintenance on a, on a property. Um, so if we do that, if we reinvest those dividends over 30 years, you can see that the, the shares uh, actually catch up a lot in terms of equity and the overall cash balance. Uh, and I'll just talk about the cash balance um, for a second. So the reason that the cash balance exceeds property over a 30 year period, and um, if people can forgive this error, it's because I've included a a blank uh, at the beginning of the series, but 
the reason is, is because that 5%, so if we compare the yields for a second, so if we've got a dividend, which is a net yield, which means there's no other expenses that need to come out of that, that's a 5%, comparing that to, uh, remember, a gross yield in residential property of 5%. Uh, it means that the net yield for property is probably closer to either one or zero or negative one percent on a cash basis, and that's why we're seeing this divergence um, over time between shares and property on a cash basis. Um, it's because shares return more on a cash basis um, compared to property. That makes sense. It's, it's because you know the, if there are dividends, and of course not all stocks have dividends, and we're just Probably assuming here there's a, you know, we're, we're buying a portfolio of, of companies or equities and some of them or a lot of them are providing dividends, um, whereas there is really no dividends, or huge dividends, I should say, from the get-go in, in a lot of properties. Of course, you can buy a positive cash flow property from day one. In these interest rate environments, it's more difficult. They become positive cash flow, but you can't then reinvest that back in, in, in sort of small increments of five or 10,000. And, and exactly like you said as well, that that's, that's one of the reasons as well, why in that bottom chart, there's that divergence <clears throat> between shares and, and property that cat, the yield is better you know, categorically in stock investing, providing you're, you're buying the right, the right equity uh, with the right type of dividend. <clears throat> one thing I wanted to, to mention as well is that if we keep reinvesting the dividends, but if we go back up to the top of the model, if I'm not mistaken, and we change the starting loan to value ratio to 0%, okay, so we, we I'm average mum and dad, I've got $75,000. There's no way in hell I'm leveraging that because leverage means risk on the upside or risk on the downside. If you're overnight, there's a GFC or whatever, the portfolio value goes down 20% now you know, I'm, I'm underwater. The bank can come in and ask for a margin call or whatever. It's, it's quite risky. I go 0%, but I continue to invest, reinvest those dividends. Then let's see how the chart transpires. And I think what we'll, what we'll see is that um, it, it's, a, it's a little bit different, right? It looks like property, once again, wins out, okay? If before we were saying 50% leverage, okay, and we're reinvesting the dividends, that way looked like stocks were, were sort of catching up, definitely beating property in terms of cash balance after sale. But if you're a low risk investor, don't want to leverage up stocks, but you keep investing dividends, then reinvesting dividends, now that doesn't matter. Property still wins out. Is that a sort of fair assumption or fair conclusion or inference there, Brendan? Yeah, that's correct. I, I'd argue that most mum and dad investors in Australia wouldn't apply any leverage to their share portfolio. Um, and I recognize that there'll be people who watch this video who, uh, who follow your content, who, who do, um, might probably because they have an interest in finance and investing and securing their financial future. But, um, just for, uh, as a general assumption, I'd say that leveraging shares is not a common, uh, activity for most investors. Sure. So it looks like property wins out when you do reinvest dividends back into your stock portfolio, which I would argue, I'm not sure, I don't have the statistics, but I, I would say more than 50% of average mum and dads probably wouldn't. They'd want to enjoy those dividends and use it for lifestyle reasons. Property wins out. Um, it, but if you do leverage to 50%, which is unlikely, and reinvest, then that's where stock trading comes to its, you know, sort of comes into its own. I think I think we did a fair... Fair job at, at sort of going through the different permutations in terms of reinvesting the dividends. Um, and of course, there's other things that, that you can do with the model. But overall, like at a, you know, 20,000 foot sort of bird's eye view, when you built this for yourself, were you surprised at the, at the outcomes or the outputs? Or was it sort of matching your gut feeling before modeling it? Uh, yeah, I actually was a little bit surprised um I, I will say though that the if you compare the performance of property against shares that are unleveraged with dividends that aren't reinvested and with cash flows with extra um, cash flow each year not invested into that portfolio uh, 
property well outperforms as as we demonstrated. Um, but what I was surprised at was the performance of shares if dividends are reinvested and if an investor makes the equivalent cash flow contribution that would be required to hold an investment property. If they are disciplined enough to make that investment year on year uh, for 30 years, then it's um, it's quite remarkable what, what that return profile looks like. Um, so I, I just leave this with people to say that um, I, I did this as someone who's invested in both asset classes. I, I don't have a um, an interest in, in pushing one asset class over the other. Um, I'm now an active property investor because I would like to use the benefit of leverage. Uh, but in the past, I've used leveraging shares to to um, be able to afford the investment properties that I, I now own. So um, I just did this purely as an intellectual exercise to have a, a conversation with a colleague. Yeah. No, I think it's, I'm sure lots of people at work um, in finance circles or accounting circles have done similar models. You know, as a, I remember when I was a graduate in, in banking, we uh, heard of a new company called Guzman Gomez and we dis created a discount cash flow model to see how profitable it, it would be. And, and we said it was going to be quite good, mostly because the cost of goods sold with like Mexican food, like corn and beans is like negligible. And, um, I didn't invest in obviously Guzman Gomez, but I should have based on my model because they've obviously done really well. So there, there's merit in these models, but of course all models are, are limited. And I think my conclusion as well is, you know, whether you pick stocks or property is a, is a personal choice. Any individual can outperform the other based on their own expertise and risk profile based on that leverage story. Um, but you know, if I try to make this content as practical, viable and implementable for the average sort of mum and dad investor, then I think like you said, Brendan, most people don't want to leverage stocks at 50%, let, you know, let alone 88% or even 10%. So if you've got $75,000 and once again, this is not financial advice, purely mathematically, you're probably better off. If you don't want to leverage stocks, you're probably better off according to this model, which may have holes in it and people should do their own due diligence, um, investing in, in real estate. But once again, it comes down to your personal choices. For me, I didn't do such a sophisticated model when I made the decision of investing in property. For me, it was like, I don't want to go to sleep one night and wake up and have lost 20% of my wealth. So that was one of the key um, sleep at night factors, the reason I invest in property. Um, but ev everyone's different, but hopefully this demonstrates that with even if you don't take 88% leverage, even with 80% leverage, you know, conservative, everyone wants to put down a 20% deposit, right? 80% leverage in property, you're outperforming an unleveraged stock portfolio. You're also outperforming in, in a lot of way, a, a small or, you know, a sort of shallow leveraged stock portfolio. It's only when you leverage up stocks and you reinvest those dividends diligently every year that you can outperform property. But once again, the assumptions that we've used for rental growth, capital growth, share market growth year on year, these are just assumptions and you can outperform them and underperform them. But a model is is meant for, you know, if you put in different assumptions, seeing what the, the what if scenarios are. Um, I think that you've done a terrific job, Brendan, and hopefully this has brought a lot of people a lot of value. Um, what, how did that discussion go with with your colleague, you know, when you actually did complete the model, I don't know, were you guys tussling it out or which side were you on versus him? How, how did that finish up? Yeah. So the, the context behind how the model came to be built was I was, was fairly confident in property's ability, uh, partly due to, to leverage, which does come through in the model that the first 15 years in particular, you really see a gap between shares and property on the equity that's generated. Uh, one thing that the model doesn't do which would be a useful exercise would be if that equity is then, you know, reinvested into other properties or, or used as capital to, to grow the portfolio, um, you would see a, a further divergence between the performance of property and shares. Um, I, I left the conversation with my colleague, uh, a bit more open-minded to, to kind of safe levels of leverage with share investing. Um, it's not something that I will be looking to actively pursue straight away. Um, I've got an interest in other asset classes um, such as commercial property, but it's, I can see the merit in 
safe levels of leverage. Um, yeah, I, I use the word safe a bit loosely. Uh, it's that's 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 up to each investor's risk tolerance as to how much um, or or if they're willing to entertain any leverage. So, I um, yeah, I'm glad I did it. The work has been interesting, and um, I've been able to share that with some people that hopefully add value to help them in their uh, their decisions. Amazing, amazing, and and as as you said, uh, Brendan. There's no right or wrong. You can use stock investing to g- bring a twenty thousand dollar deposit up to a sixty thousand, seventy thousand dollar deposit, and then get into the property market. There's also lots of people who use property as their mainstay of generating equity or generating net wealth, and then in their later years they sell them down and they put them into more passive assets like managed funds, ETFs, which give a higher sort of yield or, or dividend. So there's no right or wrong. I think both are both are interesting. I'm almost 100% in terms of my own portfolio in property, but I think you have to to go with what you think you're good at. And I think that I think I'm better at property than than stocks. I I did try stocks back when in my be- investment banking days, and even with all the contacts and information and and modeling and everything, I still couldn't couldn't make a buck. So I know where <laughs> where I I know where I stand. But hopefully that that brings everyone a lot of value, Brendan. Um, is part of the Facebook group Australian Property Mastery with Pika, and he actually posted this model in there. That's where this sort of conversation, that's the genesis of this conversation. Um, so you can find that uh, shared, you know, pictures of this model shared in the Facebook group, and there's a whole bunch of discussion there. And I think Brendan's also very kindly um, shared the model uh, for people who want it. Hopefully, um, I don't know if I want to mention this, but you could ask him if he wants to, he might inundate him with hundreds of requests, but anyway, it's up to him what he wants to do. But at the very least, there's a good sort of thorough, uh, robust discussion in the Facebook group. So uh, once again, on behalf of the community who for whom we've really done this, thank you so much, Brendan. That's okay. Uh, thanks for having me, PK. Um, and thank you everyone for, for watching or, or listening. I really appreciate it. Hopefully we, this was unbiased and not so partial. I'm always talking about property, but hopefully this sort of did sort of illuminate or, or or create some light around why property is so attractive for a lot of people and equally why stock investing is, is really attractive for other um, types of people. Uh, thank you again and thank you again, Brendan. Appreciate it. Thanks, Peter.